We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. Hi, everybody and dear participants, no matter you're online or on site. So welcome to this workshop of the antitrust regulation of internet governance in global outlook. This is a workshop is co-organized by the GigaNet and the IGP. So I'm Yi Chen and uh, from Beijing Normal University and the steering committee member of the GigaNet. So with my other three colleagues, Alison, I think it's Alison is here, or not? No, not yet. So Alison and Courtney, Courtney is on site, and also Anna, Anna is there, yeah, is on night. So uh, three of us will moni uh, moderate this workshop. So we, uh, we, uh, this workshop is to explore the way competition policy authority in EU, China, USA, and South Africa, how do they react to the growth of the internet platform? and uh, the, whether there are some commonality and the differences. So the workshop is decided to be interactive. So therefore we have a, a three part. So we also encourage you to post your questions you know, in the chat room. So therefore the panel is Marco's uh, sharing with the insight of the EU latest EU legal framework. So last but not least, we have, have a Professor Milton Muna, and we all know him very well. <laughs> so uh, Mr. Muna is a professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology School of Public Policy. And he is a specialist in the political economy of information and communication. He's also the, co he's also the co 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 founder and the director of the Internet Governance Project, and also the founding member of the GigaLatch. So uh, because the antitrust of digital platform in the US is also a highly debating the issue at the moment. So it holds the world largest internet platform such as Facebook and Twitter. So therefore, uh, Professor Muna's input is also very significant. So without any delay, I pass the floor to the, our first speaker, Dota Deng Zishong. Thank you, Dota Deng. So you have five or uh, four minutes, thank you. Thank you, uh, so, uh, so, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, so, uh, everybody. Uh, I'm just uh, speaking from Beijing, China. We ask you to please use uh, headphones or move your mic closer so that we can hear you better, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is this better? Yes, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, I will give you uh, a a picture of the uh, antitrust regulation of the platform in China. And so actually, uh, this is now a quite hard task in the Chinese antitrust community. But, but the story was quite different uh, even, even, even 40 months ago. And you know, uh, China, we introduced the anti monopoly rule in 2008. That was 30 years ago. Um, from, from 2008 until 2020. I'm sorry. so sorry to interrupt, but uh, we cannot hear you well, which means that the captioner is also unable to correctly caption um, the speaker. So we're gonna ask you to uh, Yik Chan, I would suggest we move to the other speaker and we allow the professor to uh, get a better audio situation, maybe yeah, use yeah. headphones yeah. Uh, so that yeah. we can make sure we are capturing this for the IGF. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just uh, the Dota Deng, can you use the headphone? Then we will invite uh, the second speaker, Dota He, to speak <coughs> first. Great. So you can get some time to arrange yourself. Yeah, please, Dota He. Um. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Um, it's my honor to make this uh, speech here. 
and uh, I will make it as quick as I can. Um, um, okay, let me uh, share the screen. Okay, um, there will be couples of keywords during the speech, um, like the platform mon uh, monopoly, true choice one, means Yi in Chinese and the leverage theory, essential facilities. And the uh, main issues will be included in this page. Um, 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 please look at the uh, left side. Um, the first issue we have to talk about is about the framework to uh, analysis. Uh, for analysis, when we have to decide um, whether the platform is um, um, illegal or not. Um, the first issue is to define the relevant market. And the second issue is to determine the market power. And for the first two issues, um, actually, we have detailed regulation in China. For example, we issued guidelines on relevant market definition and the interim uh, rules on the prohibition, uh, prohibition um, uh, about abuse of dominance and antitrust guidelines on platform economy. And for, for the last one, we have to decide whether um, the platform monopoly has the competitive effect on the digital markets. It means that we have to compare the advantages in providing efficiencies with the disadvantages in restricting um, competition. During this um, uh, process, we have to decide whether there is objective justifications when um, the platform um, you know, um, conduct uh, uh, abuse. Um, and it is the most important issue. Um, and for this one, in legislation, actually in China, we, we were already regulated in the interim uh, rules, just uh, as I mentioned uh, above. And in practice, actually, there will be couples of um, justifications for um, uh, the var varieties of conducts. For example, for the exclusive dealing, um, the incentives for manufacturer training and the promotion will be considered. And for tie-ins, the product design improvements will be considered and the refusals to deal um, to prevent theft of intellectual property will be considered as well. So it means that actually it is difficult for the, um, 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 for, the, for the people to file the complaints um, about the platform monopoly. Um, and uh, look at this page, we can see in the um, decision, the fine decision on Alibaba, um, actually there, there is dilemma in justification. For example, um, the Alibaba coerced the uh, operators within the platform to uh, comply with the um, two choice one policy, choose uh, one from two, I mean. Um, but uh, whether it is um, the same as the illegality of the platform monopoly, um, we should talk about it further. And why there are um, a number of compliant uh, operators who um, actually do it as the uh, Alibaba required. Um, so we can see actually there is leverage power behind it. Um, and the, the leverage power, it is also regulated in the interim rules and the guidelines in China. It is the market power of the operator in the also associated market. Uh, and uh, about another issue, it is the essential facility um, it is the for essential facility doctrine, whether it can be uh, used to, um, to decide uh, whether it is 
illegal or not. And actually in practice in the Alibaba decision, it is also uh, used, um, although it is not uh, so um, specific that um, um, the platform can constitute the um, uh, essential facility or not, but actually it, it has been mentioned. And also in guidelines, it's also um, mentioned that um, 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 on what kind of factors we should be considered and to decide whether the platform um, can be uh, considered to be illegal. Um, uh, I think that's uh, uh, all about uh, my speech. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. So then can you uh, stop the sharing, please? Oh, sure. Okay, thank you. So next speaker, we want to invite uh, Milton, uh, Professor Milton Muller. Hello, Professor? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, good. Okay. So um, I think what I can bring to this discussion is a uh, relevance to the US situation Sorry, just before you go on, could we please stop sharing the screen of the slideshow from the previous presenter? Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, sure. Please, please go ahead. Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so the United States has over 100 years of experience with antitrust. And in particular, we have experience with the problem of uh, network externalities, which is uh, some of you may heard of as network effects or the idea that if your network has more people on it, it's more valuable and that creates a feedback loop, which means that you end up with uh, re self-reinforcing of dominance. Uh, and so I think one thing we need to understand about platforms and about antitrust in communication and information industries generally is that compatibility relationships and network effects are extremely important and powerful and society has a very uh, unstable view of this. So let's talk about AT&T and the AT&T monopoly. So we had incredibly robust competition in the telephone market from, for 25 years, from 1895 to 1920. And there was a robust de definition about, oh my gosh, AT&T is taking over. We need to stop the monopoly. The antitrust authorities intervened. But at the same time, there were people saying, no, we're tired of this fragmented telephone universe because we have these competing systems that don't interconnect with each other. Uh, and so we actually want there to be a monopoly and we want to have a regulated monopoly. And ultimately that model won. So in 1920, we passed a law that said the telephone system shall be a monopoly. And then 50 years later, we accused the telephone system of being a monopoly under the antitrust laws. And we eventually broke up AT&T However, we did create an interconnection regime that allowed the competing companies to, to interconnect. Uh, go forward uh, quite a few years and talk about the Microsoft case. We had a very uh, critical uh, antitrust case against Microsoft between 1995 and 2005. Um, it really took 15 years to play itself out, but most of it happened between 96 and 2000. And again, the issue was compatibility relationships and the network externality. So Microsoft was winning and taking over the market, not so much because of its aggressive tactics, although that did play a role, but fundamentally it was compatibility. People wanted their operating system to be compatible with other people using personal computers. And so they became more and more, uh, everybody came more and more sucked into the a Microsoft operating system and applications environment. And what ultimately broke that monopoly was not so much antitrust activity, but the rise of middleware in the form of Java uh, that made uh, browsers possible and you could run applications with uh, independently of the Microsoft operating system. So I think we have the same issue with uh, today. We have these gigantic platforms and there are major economies of scale and there are major network and externalities that have made them so big, but we have to uh, decide whether we want to sacrifice compatibility and integration across these platforms for the sake of competition or, or whether people really actually want uh, this kind of uh, compatibility. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Milton.
Thank you very much, Milton. And I think uh, we will, I think uh, James probably can come back to your question because uh, the, 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 in South Africa, they're proposing, you know, this uh, uh, inquiry right now. But uh, before that, let's uh, go back to Dota Den. Hi, Dota Den, can you speak now? Yes, uh, sorry for the bad audio just now. I, I hope this, this one is clear too. Yeah, much yeah, better. Yeah. Very well. <clears throat> Please go ahead. Okay, uh, you know, uh, Right now, the antitrust regulation of the platforms actually in China is a quite hot topic. But, but, but the story was quite different, uh, actually, uh, if we go back to 14 months ago. You know, uh, in China, we introduced the anti mercury law in the year of 2008. Uh, that, that was 13 years ago. But for the first I would say for, uh, for the first 12 years, there was no one single case uh, re, uh, in terms of any uh, antitrust enforcement uh, in, the, in the internet industry. Then we, we all, all of us, we, 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 are, we, are, we are very surprised to see that uh, in the past one year, uh, there was actually quite a significant uh, enforcement, like uh, the uh, the Alibaba case, in which the Chinese antitrust authority uh, imposed a three billion US dollar fine, and uh, and also uh, regarding the the Meituan case, the food delivery uh, in the platform giant, in which the uh, the authority imposed the zero point five uh, billion. Uh, billion Fun. So uh, that's, that is, is obviously uh, uh, something uh, we will see uh, the, uh, quite different uh, uh, for the past between the, uh, between the last one year and the, the preceding, the, the 10 years. So here uh, we observe this as some kind of uh, a, a drive from the Chinese uh, top leadership and uh, uh, so as a, uh, a local practitioner uh, here in the uh, in, in, in Chinese and it has uh, a community. So uh, I will say uh, obviously uh, uh, this uh, singles some, uh, some quite uh, significant uh, those uh, a, uh, a, a turn a turn around of the uh, of the, uh, uh, the the Chinese Commission policy uh, regarding the antitrust regulation of the uh, of the platforms, and and also uh, from the technical side, we will see that the, uh, actually uh, the, there's no uh, there, there's no uh, big difference if you if we compare uh, those panel decisions uh, of the, of the Chinese cases uh, and. The, and those uh, uh, decisions decisions made by by the foreign counterparts, and so uh, I I so I just want to share with uh, with all of you uh, this uh, this kind of uh, uh, condition policy change here, and uh, uh, I hope to uh, go detail go further in detail. Uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the antitrust re re regulation of the platforms, maybe later uh, for those cases. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Dr. Chen. Then we will have a second part for discussion, so we, we can ask you further there. The next to uh, Mr. James Hodge. He is the, you know, uh, the deputy commissioner at the competition of voting in South Africa and also the chair of the inquiry, the platform on my platform inquiry. So yeah, James, can you respond here? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, um, thank very you. happy, to, happy to, to just give a brief introduction and then we can come to specific questions later. Yeah. I think like um, was outlined by Mr. Deng, the, you know, it's a journey for many of the competition authorities, the online market. It's something that has sort of crept up on us over time, but moving from a position of sort of passiveness to active enforcement does require quite a shift. And I think the first shift is 
is just educating and understanding what are the business models and consumer behavior that separates the online world from the traditional markets in order to then understand what might be new series of harm or different series of harm, or even just determining market power. So the fact that consumers may navigate to one site, the fact that Google search may be the dominant platform directing um, people, all have an impact on our assessment of the market, market power, um, as well as the, the types of theories of harm. So, so often on, on sort of online intermediation, it's more around not necessarily consumer exploitation because it's free, but exploitation potentially of sellers. And it's a buyer power type relationship. Same in advertising models. It may not be necessarily exploitation of consumers on the price, but it may be exploitation of their privacy and their data. So it is quite, quite a mindset shift. I think the second thing for South Africa is, is also to think about it strategically for ourselves. We're a small developing country at the tip of African continent, and we're not directly necessarily overseeing a Google and a Facebook such as the US or Europe might have that. So we also had to think about it strategically, where do we position ourselves? And so certainly we found um, on global mergers, there's far more of an ability to participate even as a smaller country and, and maybe one more representative of our region and our continent. So although initially we were not notified of the Facebook WhatsApp uh, merger because there was no revenue generated in South Africa, we did force Google to notify their Fitbit merger and became part of a global group of jurisdictions looking at the merger. And I think that is important to point out because I think both the authorities and even the companies are starting to realize that there needs to be a better level of coordination at a global level to come up with different regulations or different even remedies in a merger context for a firm that is global by its very nature can create quite a lot of complexities. So, so that is one way we can, um, I think, move along with others and, and add our voice to, to that overall assessment. I think with the conduct cases, Again, seeing what is being happening in other jurisdictions does provide you with insights into what may be going wrong in your own jurisdiction. So as some of the same companies appear across the globe, if, if um, a Google is being investigated for, for something in the US, the chances are that conduct may be having a negative effect in the South African economy too. There may be differences because certainly we have homegrown platforms that dominate um, or lead in, in certain areas other than social media and search. But, uh, but even there, the business models get copied. So even if it's what, a, what is happening to a booking.com in Europe, we might suggest that the same sort of conduct and effects might be present in South Africa, even if it's not booking.com that is, is the leading firm. So I think there's also a very important part about strategic uh, focus for an authority. And, and obviously the US and Europe have focused on your bigger platforms. I think for a country like South Africa, we've also got to focus on our homegrown platforms and, and conduct amongst them. Because what has often happened in a smaller developing country is that local platforms emerge mimicking the business model of the global ones, and only later may the global platforms arrive. So there are subtle differences, I think, in, in strategic approach um, that we take. Maybe a last thing to say is the importance of cooperation, not just globally, which I've mentioned, but nationally. You need to be cooperating with the, the um, information regulator around privacy issues because competition authority may want more data sharing to promote competition, but that may be the antithesis to what the, the information regulator is trying to achieve. And similarly across um, other spheres of government which may be involved in the regulation of, of the industry. So it's almost required, I think, dealing with the online economy has required far greater levels of cooperation than we've previously had. I'll stop there, um, Yik, and, and take questions later. Yes, thank you, James. It's very important issue. James just mentioned about the cooperation and the global scale of the anti-trust. So uh, in that sense, like, should we invite our last uh, speaker, Abala and Kaparanko. She's the uh, advisor to the Minister of Finance and Economy of 
Albanians, but because of Albanians, also the candidate, candidate countries for the EU. So she will share of the both EU situation and also Albanians situation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, I, I just terminated my uh, my term as a legal advisor to the Minister of Finance and Economy because we had a change of the government and I'm currently, I work uh, in PwC actually as a, as a lawyer in Albania, but that has been quite an insightful experience. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, based also on all the speakers that I've been hearing so far. So the, the situations uh, everywhere in the world is very, very similar. So everyone is pushing towards this um, new antitrust regulation. And uh, I think, and we have noticed that the European Union has taken quite a, a tough approach, uh, which has resulted in very lengthy court procedures generally towards the, the big tech. Um, well, there is a realization that what is the basis of competition law uh, in treaty on the function of, of the European Union, Article 101 and 102, two, and also the regulation is not enough to respond to the current platform economy, actually. Um, so basically, since, um, well, Europe, uh, European Union compared to others, uh, has counts around 10,000 platforms. Most of these are startups, and they account only for 2.7% of the global total value. Uh, and in order to be included in the global top 10, the minimum company value has to now rise to 5.5 billion euros. There are only 12 European companies in the, in the global top 100. Uh, this new ecosystem has required for new regulation and uh, the EU regulation on platform to business is relations entered into force in, in July, 2019. Um, it is the first, it is considered to be the first ever set of rules creating a fair, transparent and predictable business environment for smaller businesses and traders on online platform. Nevertheless, given the pandemic and uh, all this increase of the use of, of platforms, uh, the European Commission, considering also the, the several case laws, has decided to propose since last year an ambitious set of rules for the digital space. Um, that is that consists of two complementary acts, the Digital Service Acts and the Digital Market Acts. Uh, this was published last year, actually December uh, 2020, and the new rules are expected to, to create both a safer and more open digital space for all the users, and also to protect their fundamental rights, but at the same time to lead to fairer and more open digital markets for everyone by fostering innovation, growth, and competitiveness. The scaling up of smaller platforms, small, medium-sized enterprises, and startups, uh, it, is supposed, uh, it is supposed to be supported by facilitating access to to customers across the whole single market. Uh, these uh, two acts actually uh, are also being criticized. Uh, strategically speaking, they're expected to have much higher impact and be much more important than general data protection. Um, they complement they complement uh, one another, but then their results are to be seen. And taking here from the word of the previous speaker, um, there is also a need to, to consider all the international uh, scenario and see what is uh, how how can how can all these uh, regulations somehow uh, be coherent with with one another right uh, because all the all the continents and all the countries are working toward regulating them but then uh, some cooperation would be needed on a global scale it was uh, just few weeks ago, actually, when the, the General Court of EU dismisses uh, Google actions against the decision of the Commission, finding that Google abused its dominant position by favoring its comparison shopping services over competing uh, compar comparison uh, shopping services. And the court decision actually found, recognizes that the anti-competitive nature of the practice at issue uh, also they found harmful effects on the competition. So basically what we see is a tough position of European Union uh, towards the uh, giant tax. One of the concerns that is raising among 
of experts in the field actually is whether these two acts, once they enter into force, the uh, digital service package of the European Union, uh, can they have some can they work to the disadvantage uh, of the of the EU, considering that actually most of the big techs, uh, they are homegrown outside European Union, and there are very few startups, there are a few startups compared to others, and just based on the latest data that I read, just one sub is here in, uh, in European Union. Uh, well, when we move to Albania, but then I will leave it to the questions. We are quite lagging behind in that regard. Albania has opened, uh, is uh, negotiating chapters, so the legislation is, is being approximated. Um, our competition law, our consumer protection actually are quite old laws. Uh, E-commerce is also on old law in Albania, so I think it will be the next decade that will show how we are going to cope with uh, all the new everything that is happening uh, the last the last uh, eurostat showed uh, the last eurostat index showed actually that consumer in albania they don't use online platforms so much which is somehow not true actually due to the informal economy but that's very typical and specific to the economy of the country okay so i will leave it here for the moment okay, thank, thank you, you. Yeah, thank you, Abella. Yeah, just uh, now we, we just have a few questions uh, from the, the panelists that you answer before we move to the Q&A sections. And uh, so first, uh, I, I would like to ask uh, the two Chinese speakers. Uh, so there's one particular question is about, uh, do you think the Chinese approach uh, is different from the uh, US approach? W what is the major difference? Uh, or, uh, can any of you Give us some idea, Dota He or Dota Chen. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, I think I can share some of the ideas. Yeah. Um, um, actually, I think um, there are couples of uh, differences between the Chinese approach and the US approach. For example, um, as for the um, regulation of the abusive conduct um, um, in legislation, both sides have this kind of regulation on the abusive conduct, but in le legislation, for example, in the US, um, they actually focus on the uh, e e um, illegally maintain the, um, the, the, the dominant position that the platform has, have already got, but in China, um, we will focus on the abusive conduct itself, which means that um, um, we can actually, we can use the leverage theory because um, in the US actually, the leverage theory is not supported um, in most of the cases, like the well-known uh, Microsoft case, the leverage, theory is not supported in that case. And uh, for some other um, traditional theories like the essential facilities, um, both of countries are conservative in the application of um, essential facilities doctrine to the digital market. But um, like, like I have already mentioned in the PPT, um, uh, China has already tried to um, sp specifies it in the uh, legislation about um, on what kind of factors we have to um, consider to decide uh, whether the platform can constitute the essential facilities or not. But in the US, uh, in the US, um, it, it is sort of more conservative about this issue, and um, um, and uh, um, on the other. Hence, um, um, both of uh, China and the uh, uh, US um, have, not, uh, have not yet uh, come up with some kind of um, black list or white list or gray list. Um, but uh, let me, uh, let, uh, let's see the EU, um, they issued the DMA, it's sort of um, kind of filter for um, the careful scrut uh, scrutiny to decide uh, whether 
um, the dominant platform um, is um, 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 deserves more concerns actually. Um, but I think we can do more. Um, um, so we have to uh, make you. more efforts. Uh, okay. okay, we I'm will sorry. ask. Uh, yes. So time is up. So we will ask okay. a response from uh, Milton and Abana okay. uh, regarding to that. Maybe James also can comment on that. Yeah, let's give Milton a chance to jump in here on the difference between U.S. and China. Yeah, just the um, I think Cheng said very pertinent things about the substantive doctrine behind antitrust. But I think to me, the biggest difference is procedural. In other words, in the U.S., the companies are tried under a law and they take it to an independent judiciary that then decides whether they've actually violated the law. And I get the impression that in China, that the, if the executive agencies decide that you've violated the anti-monopoly law, that's it, you're, you're done. And that's why they move so swiftly. And, and in the US, these cases drag on for, for five or 10 years. Okay, yeah, maybe <laughs> Abana can also comment on Dota He's yeah, uh, comment on the difference between the EU, oh, sorry, the US and China. So what is the approach in EU as well? Oh, um, <laughs> Sorry, sorry. Uh, it's, it's, uh, Ching, you can continue. Oh, uh, yeah, I was yeah. just reading one of the questions, actually, which is quite, uh, I would say maybe it's also a ret rhetorical question. If would the EU be so eager to crack down on big tech if there were EU home ground alternatives as, as big as Google, Facebook, and Amazon? I think that everyone, uh, I mean, if we refer to, to all these continents and countries and stakeholders, everyone is trying to level the playing field. Uh, and also is a question, I believe that most of everything else is certainly a question of power. I mean, we can never escape that, right? Um, EU itself is more paternalistic than other system. Uh, continental Europe is uh, characterized by, by civil law system, which tend to become very paternalistic and very rigid in, in ex ante regulation, actually. So I wouldn't have any answer, definite answer to that, because I believe that the question itself could be quite quite rhetorical, but I believe that it is uh, also a controlling strategy for, for all the countries. History of you over the last years, uh, well, shows us that uh, you is being quite rigid in terms of all these big tax. So that was it for my part. Thank you. Yeah, you know, uh, I can, I can give some uh, supplementals from, from my angle. So uh, I will say that uh, actually, in, if you look into the regulation, and also if you uh, look into those cases, actually, uh, I will say that there is no significant difference among the Chinese and the Chinese law and the, the US and the Chinese law and also the EU competition law. I, I, I agree that, that you know, the, the main difference uh, is with the procedures. But if, we, but, but, but if we go further, I will say the main difference is with the attitude. So why in the first 10 years, there's no one single case uh, in China regarding the uh, antitrust regulation of platforms, but all of those cases just emerged within just one year. Uh, I think that the, the attitude of the uh, Chinese top leadership uh, is a key point in this regard. It, it's just like, you know, in, in the US, you know, the Trump administration, the Biden administration, and the previous, like the, uh, the Bush administration, you know, they the adopt the, the quite different uh, uh, attitude, uh, you know, in, in, this, in this regard. Thank you, thank you. So, do you want to respond to Milton's, uh, Professor Muna's uh, question, whether it is uh, only about the procedure? Um, actually, um, I also learned a lot from the other um, spe uh, speakers. Um, yes, um, um, actually, um, you know, the, uh, the monopoly law is uh, just issued uh, like 10 years ago. So we still have a, a lot of uh, experience to, um, um, to to learn from the other countries, but uh, we also have uh, many practices in a lot of uh, uh, cases 
uh, which is uh, focused on the digital market. So we also learned a lot from the practice, um, uh, like uh, um, uh, we issued the, the platform uh, guidelines. So that's what we are making our, our efforts about this issue. Um, yes, that's all. Mm. Thank you. Okay, so I think next we want to also move to the James. I think James, in your um, uh, commission's inquiry and initiative, actually you incorporate the concept of public interest component, which is different from other most of the competition authority. So uh, how does this uh, public interest angle impact on your approach to regulating online platform? I think Chinese, I think in Chinese anti uh, trust law, do they, I do not re remember they have a public interest component, all right? Yeah, so James, please. Yeah, so I'm, I'm very happy. Yeah, I think that the debate that's just happened is interesting. I think there are procedural issues, but it's also how the law is constructed. So our law incorporates um, the public interest, which has a broader development angle and, and also a sort of specific focus on participation of small business and in the South African apartheid context, historically disadvantaged individuals who, who were discriminated against and not given opportunity under apartheid. So it does affect what we're capable of doing and also where our interest and focus can lie that may differ. So, so just to, to give an example, with small business, we do have provisions around fairness in the bargaining relationship with, with um, powerful buyers. We do have a lower standard in terms of things like price discrimination, in terms of just how we may um, frame those cases rather than under substantial lessening of competition, but more impeding their participation. And of course, in the online world, what it has meant is we've also added a focus of South African business participation in the global economy. So in our online platform inquiry at the moment, you know, part of that is also to understand whether we are just going to be dominated by global platforms or is there scope for local platforms to emerge and compete. Different business models, maybe different focus, um, but is there something inherent in, in some of these markets that may, may, may end up being that South African platforms are pushed out of these spaces. So, so certainly the public interest has that, that element. Just on the procedures and tools, I mean, you know, guidelines were mentioned, um, whether you go to court or not, and every country will have different procedures. So for us, we could run an abuse of dominance procedure. And if you're looking at the major platforms, dominance is easy to establish. But a market inquiry looks at any factor that may hinder competition. So it doesn't have to be about a dominant firm. It can be about a market practice. Um, and that gives you a lot more flexibility in order to to look at things you can't under typical abuse of dominance. So you can look at, for instance, you know, just whether certain types of consumer behavior or how consumers' choices is shaped may shape competition on the platform or between platforms. So, so I think any authority looks at the tools they've got, the law they've got, and makes strategic choices around what is effective in what situation. Okay, thank, thank you, you, James. Again. Let's go to Milton now for um, kind of your response to that. And then I just wanted to invite the audience if you who's in the room and also online, we are going to go to Q&A after we hear from Milton. So there's a microphone set up here if you if you want to come up here. But Milton, can kind of your response here? I don't have a lot to say in response. I think um, uh, Mr. Jett um, sort of confirmed my perception that really in, in China, there was a change in attitude of the top leadership and suddenly uh, there was a decision, we're gonna go after big tech and cut them down to size. And, and it wasn't litigated or legally driven in the way that it is in the US. And you may like that or you may not like that. Um, you know, <laughs> if you just wanna get big tech, the Chinese way is much more efficient. If you want to have more of a, a rule of law uh, you're giving them the right to defend themselves and hire expensive lawyers and 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 go through these these legal criteria. So that's that's the difference, I think. And, and it's interesting also to hear from the South African authority um, how much more flexibility they have. Uh, this would not fly with most of the antitrust economists in the U.S. They would want a much more 
you have to be a monopoly and you have to abuse or do something illegally with that market power rather than just some kind of practice that people think is unfair because we're very concerned about uh, competitors just using the antitrust laws to protect themselves rather than actually protecting the market process. Yeah, All I right. think that's, yeah, please, uh, uh, I think that's a, that's a difference uh, which, uh, which just public interest uh, component incorporated by the, by the South African Competition Commission. Yeah, now we're open to the floor. So Courtney, do you want to invite? Yes, we have one. Um, we have one person here. If you can take the mic, and then we will also, you know, go back to the discussions. So we want to make sure we keep this engaging and interactive. Hello. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, it's uh, it's Katerina from Georgia, the country. Uh, so from the perspective of the small, I'm rep representing the regulator, uh, Georgian regulator, and uh, when the the um panel representatives are talking about the big tech platforms antitrust uh, behavior or, or possible abuse of dominance etc right uh, this uh, all of this is uh, considered on the regional level on a country level on the sovereign level as i've heard today on a, in a different panel but the effect of uh, this behavior for the even small countries like georgia is it's it's also crucial right uh, whenever it might be damaging for our Georgian customers, Georgian alternative platforms. And uh, my question is, where do you see this cooperation, for example, for, for the antitrust bodies in uh, smaller countries or the who are not the home country for Facebook or Google, et cetera, but they uh, see that the breaches even, uh, for example, how they um, self-regulate the content, for example, how Facebook self-regulates their content. This is something beyond uh, Jordan legislation, but this is the challenge, for example, for, for countries, uh, where, uh, for our consumers and for our stakeholders. So where do you see this cooperation? Thank you. Thank you. Um, let, Milton, do you wanted to respond to that? And then we'll go to the um, online panelists. Okay, or I think that's a good point. Milton um, suggests we get some additional questions. And Allison, why don't you go ahead and, and throw in your question? That way we can go to the panelists and make sure that we have time to respond to several. And we'll have one more in the room after Allison. Sure, thanks very much, Courtney. Um, mine was really a kind of follow up question for, for, for James, but I think it does relate um, to the others. And part of it has been answered by, by the response to the public interest question. Although I think the real nub there is how you balance those public interest um, issues, which is obviously um, not easier. Um, James, I mean, you were speaking about, you know, what you could do within the legislation and you were distinguishing between a, a, um, anti competitive abuse of um, behavior as opposed to a market review. And I was just wondering from a kind of technical point of view, um, what the challenges are in dealing with these digital markets with these um, global markets, global players around kind of defining your market in order for the, so I know for the market review, perhaps you don't have those problems which you would have with a, um, you know, an anti-competitive um, behavior case, but you know, it does raise the question of, um, well, it, it, it firstly raises this question of, you know, maybe somebody is um, dominant, your a local player is dominant in your market, but maybe that's the only way we're gonna be able to compete at a global level. And so it does raise that public interest question, which I don't think is easily answered. So I would like, if you could go back and just sort of say how you have to weigh those issues um, without obviously um, indicating your, your findings on this inquiry, which is still open. But then practically, how do you actually define these markets in order to review them? And particularly then, you know, in terms of the um, uh, identification of any um, practice or abuse that you want to um, remedy, how do you actually remedy some of these things? Because, you know, you may, they may be in your jurisdiction in some form or other, or they may not actually legally exist within your jurisdiction. But then how do you do the, you know, enforce those remedies? And you've spoken about the need for global collaboration in order to, to do some of these things. Um, but, you know, you're not going to get the United States um, instituting an antitrust thing against Facebook or whatever, just because it's been found by the South African case that, you know, the WhatsApp Facebook relationship is, um, uh, you know, um, anti-competitive or something like that. I just wondered if you could give us a little bit of the technical granularity and challenges there in dealing with this compared to 
um, you know, at old analog markets. Okay, thank you, Edison. So we will take the other question and then the panelists can answer three of them together or four. Sorry, I had one right. form of flow. So Andrew, could you please uh, unmute you and uh, you can ask your question now. Andrew, yeah, please go ahead. You have to unmute you. We cannot hear you. Oh, sorry, is that better? Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I put this in the chat, but I'll, I'll just sort of read it out loud. And this might be of uh, particular relevance to uh, James, possibly other panelists. Um, uh, and that's the uh, uh, area of uh, standards development, um, uh, specifically so internet standards. Um, most of the sort of standards bodies are, that I'm familiar with are dominated by the tech sector um, and have little or no input uh, or indeed oversight from any other stakeholders at all. Um, and arguably, some of the, the recent standards developments appear to favour centralisation of infrastructure and strengthen the uh, market dominance of the, of the uh, established major players. Um, so with that in mind, should internet standards face greater scrutiny from antitrust regulators? Um, and, <laughs> and no offence attended, uh, uh, James, but um, do those regulators have the necessary knowledge and skills to do this uh, in, in that sort of environment of standards development? Thank you. James, we're going to give you a couple minutes to get your thoughts together because you've got some detailed questions. Take one last question from the room and then go back to all the panelists. So uh, we're, we'll go to James first since you've had a couple of pointed questions, but please all the panelists get ready um, after this other question. Thank you, I'm Victor Bertola from Open Exchange. And uh, my question stems from some of the comments that, that were made before about the EU approach, since I've been quite involved with the current EU uh, regulatory attempts. So uh, I'd agree that they, they come from, I mean, a change of attitude even in, in Europe. I mean, Europe has not been basically regulating for a long time or touching the original regulation from the end of the 90s. And all of a sudden, some things happened uh, that prompted the European leaders to, I mean, come, uh, come forward with some pretty heavy regulation that is currently being discussed. But if you have a look at this, this is not really just about uh, market power and economy, as it was I mean, suggested by one of the comments. I mean, the, 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 the events that prompted this regulation are stuff like the US Cloud Act, or there are stuff like uh, the, the ban of President Trump from social media. If you, if you remember, uh, uh, Merkel commented it very, very negatively. And uh, all, I mean, these, these are the, the kind of things that prompted some action. So my, my perception is that, uh, yes, it's a matter of antitrust regulation. Of course, it's a matter of economy and so on. But it's also a matter of using antitrust regulation to address stuff which is not really just about market power, but it's more about fundamental rights. And uh, I mean, the fact like also that the person from Georgia was commenting that many countries, including Europe, feel that they have no power, no sovereignty uh, over the, the policies of these big, big tech companies. So do you feel that maybe at the, the antitrust regulation, which is the only common base across, I mean, market economies across the world, is used as a proxy for the lack of, I mean, regulation, common regulation and common ways of action on other issues, I mean, connected to freedom of speech, content control, these kind of things. Thank you very much. There's kind of a common theme throughout several of these these questions, but James, I think we should go to you first to respond to the specific um, questions raised, and then. Yeah, very happy to. Um, and Andrew doesn't doesn't um, insult me, so don't worry about that. I think, as I indicated before, learning is part of this process, and that's where maybe to come to Alison's questions. You know. Probably five years ago, we, we led through a merger of two big e-commerce platforms because the view was they're constrained by retail, the brick and mortar retail. One of them is making a loss. Are they failing firms? And I think those are the lessons you, you have over time. And so there has to be a massive investment in your teams and your understanding of the business models. I mean, we even considered bringing in business people to, to kind of educate us around business models and how things work. Because quite easily you can be hoodwinked into thinking that, that for instance, you know, we recently had one of the first probably prohibited um, platform mergers um, in South Africa. And again, you know, we were presented with facts that there's lots of entrants, but we know in this sort of market, deep pockets and, and the ability to expand is probably what separates out um, true constraints from from just wannabes. So I think the the issue of of there's a lot of technical stuff where we need to get involved, and we can't just move. So on the in issue of internet standards, we would have to be educated ourselves before moving. But part of the problem that you've raised, Alison, is is remedies. And to be quite frank, 
um, I think there's a lot of um, sort of people out there that believe that apart from paying fines, that a lot of the remedies that have been imposed, quite frankly, do not work. So in Google Shopping, there's a lot of research that suggests it hasn't worked. It hasn't, in fact, promoted comparator shopping sites. And firms find a way to work around. We saw Korea just recently introduced a law to try and bring down the price of, of um, commissions or the level of commissions amongst app stores. But um, the law there required um, the app stores to offer an alternative payment means. And all Google did was come and say, well, I'll charge you 11% because you're going to spend three or 4% dealing with the payments operator. So the overall fees are still the same. So there's a lot of work around, and this is primarily one of the problems with regulation, that it can be ineffective in such a dynamic space. And that maybe brings me to, to the, the first question, which was around cooperation. I mean, South Africa, as a small nation, has had to stand up and assert our jurisdiction. But the problem that every competition authority faces is you only have jurisdiction over economic activity in your country. And even that for some of the global platforms will be questioned if they have no presence in your country. So, so it is an issue where we need more global cooperation because as I mentioned earlier, global cooperation means that you can collectively have more, I think, influence over a large platform. They are substantially large. I think, um, you know, I think one of our former entrepreneurs who now heads up Tesla and SpaceX recently had his own net worth exceed the South African GDP. That is the kind of difference in bargaining power that exists. So unless there is global cooperation, I think the small nations will be left behind in the process. And the point of that cooperation is more to ensure that rules that may be thrashed out on a bigger global stage between the US and, and the EU also filter down to the other countries as well. So that is gonna be, I think, critical in order to protect the smaller country consumers. Uh, I think uh, whether uh, others want to also comment on those issues of global collaboration and uh, as a policy, the last question about whether the competition law can act as a policy, you know, to tackle the global issues, maybe Abala can respond and also Jay, Jay Den, can you respond as well? And uh, also Newton. Yeah, please yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm thankful to the gentleman who posed the comment and also uh, the question. Um, well, I totally agree with, with your approach. It is a proxy uh, as well uh, to respect all the EU existing legislations that is not only related to the antitrust regulation. So in that regard, we agree. This comes very clearly also uh, in all the, the documents uh, that address these two new acts that are expected to enter in force. As for the lady who um, talked about Georgia, uh, I fully understand you because I think uh, Albania stays in a very similar position actually to, to Georgia, uh, maybe even a bit uh, in a transitory phase if we take into consideration all the change of the legislation and the regulatory environment and uh, enforcement issues that have been persistent uh, throughout all the last decades. Thank you. And also, uh, Jace, do you want to respond to the cooperation and how the China to cooperate with other global partners in terms of antitrust or whether there's a global framework can build? Sure, sure. You know, uh, I had the chance uh, to participate in in the Chinese antitrust law leg legislation. So back to uh, 14 years ago. So uh, at that time, actually, uh, China, uh, we introduced the, the competition law, uh, mainly based on the models of the US and the, and the EU and uh, uh, in those enforcement, I, I understand that the Chinese authority actually uh, has a number of communications with both the US and the, the EU counterparts. But, but the Chinese authority is quite cautious on those uh, cooperation on, of those uh, specific cases. And uh, uh, Right now, China is in the process of revising 
the anti-mercury rule. And we introduce uh, some doctrines actually uh, borrowed from the from the US antitrust law and the and the, and the EU competition law. And uh, from 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 my from 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 my perspective, I, I observe uh, the some uh, some communications and uh, interactions between between the Chinese authority and uh, its foreign counterparts uh, in in certain in certain investigations and and uh, I think that it's more important for uh, for 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 U.S. EU and China to establish some kind of mechanism. So, uh, in in which some the, the, the authority they can they can build up some uh, uh, regular uh, communications and the corporations. Uh, so up up to now we we, we only have the BRICS uh, mechanism. So in which uh, you know uh, uh, China, the Russia, and the, the South Africa, the India, uh, the, 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 they have some uh, so, some regular. Uh, Communications. So, uh, for the in, in the in the long uh, in the long term, uh, it it will be quite important to for those major uh, jurisdictions to uh, to build up some uh, kind of uh, international uh, uh, competition enforcement uh, cooperation mechanism. Okay. Thank you, uh, Milton. Do you want to respond? From American perspective. Yeah, those are a very complex set of questions, uh, particularly the one about cooperation across small country jurisdictions. I'm, I'm not sure how to respond to that without hemming and hawing. Um, but um, I do want to respond to Vittorio's comment. Um, so I think it's very dangerous and unadvisable to, to use antitrust as a proxy for something else, right? And in fact, this is one of the abuses of um, of antitrust law that's well known in, in history is that basically uh, people who are losing a competition uh, get the government to intervene on their behalf. And then particularly in a dynamically changing technological market, you, you find out that the interventions you make either have no effect, like uh, Mr. Hodges pointed out, or you find out that the whole market structure changes five years down the road. And particularly if you're in a lit litigious system like the US, your, your conclusion is pretty much irrelevant or even distorting and making things worse uh, down the road. So an example of this is the, um, you know, the, uh, the AT&T uh, breakup. Uh, not that I didn't support that. It was good to break that up and create uh, competition, but the whole system was premised on the idea that there is a long distance market, right? And we're going to have this uh, elaborate structure of making equal access between the local exchange and the long distance market. And then 10 years after this uh, settlement, you know, there is no long distance market because cell phone uh, collapses the entire country into the local exchange market. So the whole premise of that system was basically wiped out in the space of a few years. And, and you could say similar things about the Microsoft uh, settlement. So you have to be careful. Uh, I mean, you may feel threatened by and not like these big firms, but you have to ask, why are they big? And one of the reasons is, what are the basic economic factors driving you know, these markets? And uh, if they are advertising driven, then the more eyeballs you have, the more valuable you are. If there are network externalities, then uh, having everybody on the same network uh, generates huge benefits for the users. And you have to think about what you're doing when you try to break that up. So all of these big interventions tend to founder on the notion of finding a good remedy. Uh, you know, what is the actual remedy that will make things better? And uh, if, if that remedy is not really a question of sort of the abuse of monopoly power, then don't use antitrust law, come up with new legislation, which is what the Europeans are doing uh, we'll see how it works. I don't have a good enough grasp to know how I think it will work. Uh, but, but if indeed you want new rules for these markets, then formulate new rules, but don't say, you know, we're going to redefine the nature of uh, anti-monopoly law because we don't like you. <laughs> you know, you've, got, you've got to have a rule of law. You've got to have stable expectations uh, for economic progress. 
And uh, I think uh, the, the, this, this, this is very interesting questions because I think uh, uh, in both uh, James' speech and also Abana's, uh, the EU uh, antitrust law, there's a component about the public interest, is that right? So, and I think James also mentioned that when the South Africa Commission considered uh, consider public interest, one of the components is about how to protect the local enterprise, is that right? So, uh, but, uh, uh, but uh, Milton's point is that uh, this should not uh, be one the com component to be considered. So what, what is your response, James? For my understanding of Milton's point. Look, uh, I, I think to be frank, globally, there is a greater focus on exactly what you may consider these sort of softer competition issues around privacy, around um, inequality, around access to platforms. Uh, so I think the world has definitely shifted more towards the direction of the South African comp competition law in the last five years. And, and, um, and even I think the US has shifted, you know, under the new administration and, and with the success of the, the sort of group who, who have now taken over the Federal Trade Commission and DOJ. So I think there is a role for that. It's how you balance it. And, and our position has always been rather have it in the law. You know, it used to be that there's sort of political discretion around strategic issues that existed even I think today in UK law. Our approach is put it in the law that forces a proper weighing up. And South Africa has a court system, much like the US, although we have a specialist court, not a lay court that can hear these matters. But that has resulted in the fair balance. Um, so to take a, one example in merger control, we do, we do look at retrenchments and whether retrenchments as a result of the merger are harmful to workers and are, if they're necessary. And, and that has never prevented a merger going through and that's the balance that has been maintained. In the online world, we're going to have to navigate this. And part of the reason for an inquiry is exactly the way to explore that. But um, to take an example, if, 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 you know, what we have been exploring in public hearings is, is if Google search is the, the channel or the top of the funnel for most commercial activity, then what happens on the first page of Google matters and, and can does that start to shape and favor those with the deepest pockets who are global, who are going for a sort of scorched earth? Can you have almost a predatory approach of a low and no return on investment? So most of the advertisers look at the return in terms of bookings or whatever that they get, that you can have predation in that context. So, so whether there's a remedy for that, that is, I think, where I would agree. There is, this is complex. It does change business models. And it's not easy, and it may have unintended consequences. You may remove the top ads on Google and find that the organic is still dominated by the bigger companies mm -hmm. that invest in search engine optimization. So that is probably the biggest challenge. I, I think there are interventions such as the platform to business regulations that the EU brought in around transparency, around that which um, probably work more effectively. I think other regulation may be undone by, by dynamic dynamics, um, but this is certainly the challenge. And I think one raised in, the, in the, the sort of forward for the session was also about different business models. In food delivery, we're seeing local models by local entrepreneurs servicing a need in areas where the big companies have not gone. But when the big companies come, are they gonna be destroyed? When your business model is sink massive amounts into consumer marketing promotion, does that change it? Can we have both um, there in the market and, and how? Mm. So I think we are at that exploratory stage. I mean, for us as an inquiry and, and I think globally, and we don't always have the answers and we've stepped with trepidation, but the reality is there are dominant platforms, there is abuse, and that has to be on the radar for, for, for treatment. Okay, thank you, James. I think that's a very complicated, uh, you know, questions. And uh, also, I think uh, as far as I knew, uh, in Chinese uh, anti uh, anti you know, antitrust law, they also took this as a consideration whether the bigger platform could destroy you know, diversity variety in the market. But we can we can we have to have another hour to discuss this. But, uh, so I have to pass the mic to the next question. And Anna, do you want to? 
speak for your question. Yes, thank you, Chan, and thank you, everyone, for a really interesting, insightful discussion. So we have a question from the chat for Milton this time. And after uh, you answer, Milton, I pass the mic to Courtney, who also has a question, and also to continue with questions from the live audience. So Milton, the question for you is from Jorge Cancio. And he says, what do you think is the agenda on platforms of the Biden administration and how does it relate to the projected Alliance for the Future of the Internet, which was in the news? Uh, so we're going to take two more questions and throw another round. So I do want to invite anyone from Tucson. Courtney, we cannot hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Not just one drop. Let's see Is this working? Here. Okay. Yes, um, so I want to invite uh, anyone in the live audience to come up to the microphone to ask your question after my question. Uh, so my question is whether we're thinking about this in the right way and whether the current frameworks or legal frameworks are adequate to assess the potential antitrust implications of some of these major platforms where it's not in a single, um, it, you know, it's not in a single business, um, whether it's actually about advertising or whether it's about data and whether we can think more creatively about antitrust, for example, putting, you know, data into a public trust. Um, how could we think outside of the box since we are in a new environment and are the current legal frameworks even adequate to this. And as we think about trust and, and earlier this, this question around kind of cooperation and, and multi-stakeholderism um, in the standard setting, I would just think, you know, ask the two regulators on the panel about how they're incorporating not just business and not just government perspective, but civil society and uh, you know, advocacy groups on behalf of not just users, but citizens, people, the individuals who are affected by all of this. Okay, that's my question. We're gonna to go to one more question here from the floor. Please um, introduce yeah. yourself. Uh, okay, uh, I would like to just uh, take your uh, consideration, all the panels to the super applications. Uh, I think uh, in many countries right now, uh, especially Eastern countries, uh, the, I, I, let me call them mobile first countries, which uh, people uh, they got get familiar with internet within their mobile cell phones, right? So they are more and more using super applications. There is one app and everything. Then when they are the interns, they log in to the app, they will see everything. And as much as they use the super applications and the super applications, they're getting more users. The power of regulators to just select to put their rules inside the super is less and less because you cannot ban a super application with billions of users like WeChat, Gojek. We have seen more and more every day. So my big question is how uh, regulators, how local regulators can regulate the uh, antitrust policies, antitrust regulations inside the regional and even global huge super applications. Thank you. Any other questions? So we will collect the question and post to the panelists. There, there is just one more question in the room if you want to make it quickly and then this may be the last round. Okay. There are no other questions in the chat at this point. If there's anyone from those attending uh, virtually uh, wants to address a question, please uh, uh, raise your hands now or write them okay. in the chat. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, please go ahead. Okay, I'm Mohammed and I represent Iranian audiovisual regulatory body for uh, digital medias. Actually, one of our main concern is regarding like uh, international platforms. I'm coming from Iran. Most of the international platforms have no office and have no uh, authority person there. But the thing is that they're uh, like uh, generating a huge revenue from this issue. And many, many local platforms have problems because due to media concentration, they can but reach their voices. And, uh, but personally, as a person who's coming from legal and technical background, how, uh, I don't know uh, which panel is more related, but how do you consider uh, computational antitrust? You know, because I believe that the future, uh, we are entering into Web3 era. And I believe the, 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 the current and classic uh, antitrust and competition regulation itself cannot ensure 
itself cannot ensure. So how do you consider computational antitrust for future could solve this issue? Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I think since we had a specific question for Milton, uh, who had forgotten it and now remembers it, we'll go to him first and then go to the panelists on the Zoom room to uh, respond to the very variety of different questions. Go ahead, Milton. Milton, just right. Remind. So the should I go? Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Okay. <laughs> the Biden administration obviously has taken a, uh, at least nominally, uh, in, in terms of posturing, they've taken a more aggressive approach to antitrust enforcement. And, um, and there's also a ton of legislation about platforms in the United States, most of it um, pretty um, simple minded kinds of uh, let's get the platform kinds of things and not very well thought out, frankly. Uh, but um, they are, in fact, talking about retroactively making uh, Facebook, I think, divest Instagram, which in terms of remedies is one of the more coherent um, ones that you might want to think about. But again, it wouldn't, I mean, it, it would make Facebook smaller and uh, cr possibly create some competition in that particular market. But uh, we have seen, in fact, uh, TikTok come along and um, really uh, eat uh, Facebook's lunch in a certain area of, of social media. Uh, so the idea that the market is closed to that kind of innovation uh, is, is different. I don't think there is a strong relationship between the Biden administration's approach to uh, competition policy and their proposed alliance, which I'm, I'm waiting to see what exactly that consists of. But um, I, I think that they might have some kind of idea that the the internet should be you know the services on the internet should be competitive blah 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 but um i don't think that there's a strong relationship there and again in the u.s things are very legally driven so whatever the biden administration justice department does about platforms regarding their antitrust or anti-monopoly situation is going to have to be grounded in existing antitrust law or they're going to have to get new uh, new regulations or new um, new legislation from from Congress, and uh, we all know how uh, effective the U.S. Congress is at uh, passing uh, comprehensive laws. I'll leave Thank it at you. that. I, I can't address the uh, Iranian guy's uh, question, but uh, I think I've spoken enough. Thank okay, you. Thank you. I think we we yeah. That's the two last the two question, and uh, the one is about the super applications, and the other one is about the computation antitrust law. So can the panelists uh, respond to that two questions? So yeah, James, please go ahead. I, maybe... I could just offer a quick response. I mean, on the computational, what we and other jurisdictions are doing is, is at least you're trying to use technology, I mean, primarily around detection of collusion. So this is where informatics can help um, in terms of just scraping prices from different areas, government tenders, et cetera, and in order to, automate that sort of process. So that's been probably your biggest in investment in computational antitrust. Um, obviously moving online in a pandemic has spurred us to move electronically. That has been another shift forward as well. Um, in terms of the involvement of civil society, certainly from the South African perspective, that's always been a cornerstone for us. And even in abuse cases, we sometimes bring in civil society as, as um, friends of the court. So if it's a case in respect of an abuse of, say, um, a pharmaceutical company or healthcare or price gouging in a pandemic, these all, I think, are important. In an inquiry, we also have reached out to other regulators, government, um, industry organizations, and, and that is critical as well. And in terms of building that legal framework, I think to, to Courtney's question, part of the problem is that, that many of the issues are cross-cutting as one of the the people earlier sort of highlighted in the question. And so that's why you need cooperation. I mean, just this morning, I had a meeting with our advertising standards body to find out if they have any advertising standards for, for internet companies. We've heard from the information regulator, but there are gaps. And this also makes enforcement quite difficult because many firms may question your jurisdiction. Are you in fact entitled to look at this or must you leave it for someone else? And then another regulator has got to go through the process. But they are so intertwined that probably those jurisdictions with a single consumer protection law mixed with competition law are, are at a big advantage in this space. Okay, thank you. 
Jake, do you want to also respond to the question about uh, super application or the computation antitrust? Hi. Jade, do you want to respond from the Chinese perspective about uh, the super application? Hello? Yes. Uh, Maybe. Okay. okay. <clears throat> you know, sure. You, you, you know, uh, In China, uh, actually, we uh, we we are also face uh, some uh, quite a similar problem. You know, here, actually, uh, the Chinese uh, internet uh, business or market is separated from the other parts of the world. Uh, not only because of the language, but also be, uh, because of those uh, you know those restrictions, those uh, those policies, and then. Uh, Based on the quite big uh, the population, so here uh, we we have some quite some some very big players like for the e-commerce we have the Alibaba, like the uh, the short video we have the tick, tick, TikTok, like the social media uh, we have uh, the Tencent's uh, WeChat, and uh, uh, here uh, we 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 are also. Uh, Celebrating the, the issue of how we can we uh, promote the diversity, how we can just uh, uh, you know using the uh, antitrust law to uh, to safeguard uh, those uh, uh, interests of the small and uh, medium-sized uh, players. So one one solution uh, might be the, uh, that uh, uh, for now uh, we. We, we we have the policy of uh, look looking into those uh, those mergers in which the big platforms uh, is acquiring uh, small or, or medium sized uh, uh, platforms uh, like this uh, and and uh, for those for for those merger control cases uh, we. Will be more cautious, just to uh, to prevent that the big platforms they will they will leverage their size, and their and, and their money uh, to uh, just to to restrict the the those uh, those the, those uh, growth of the small or, or medium size the, their competitors. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And Abana, do you want to respond to the question about? Uh, Computation antitrust and the super application. How do we it at the European level? Um, thank you. Rick. Unfortunately, it's a question I cannot give in my expertise. I'll leave it to people who actually work on on the field of computational uh, okay. antitrust. I cannot deliver any answer to that. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, thank you. And uh, do we? Uh, is there any other question? Not in the room, and I think we yeah. have five minutes only. Yeah, yeah. No, no questions in the chat either. Okay, so then we will have to we will wrap up this section. I think uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all for participating, and especially thank for all these uh, distinguished speakers. You know, to give us very insightful and exciting debate on those issues. And uh, as we can see, you know, this is a very complicated issue, and. Uh, also, they have a different component and the consideration. And uh, I think probably the collaboration at the global level may not be reachable in the near future, but it certainly is something we need to consider. So uh, last, uh, I want to ask each speaker to wrap up their stand uh, position by one sentence. Should we start from the Milton? One sentence, please. Okay, here comes a very long sentence. First of all, I would like to thank Yik Chen for putting this together. It's a really great idea to have this kind of a comparative uh, and, and you really brought together a, a very good group of people. So I would say um, technology markets are dynamic and uh, uh, don't mistake temporary dominance for permanent dominance and uh, always be aware of how you know markets evolve and how when companies get big, sometimes it's because they're doing things that people want them to do. Okay. Can you speak in one sentence to wrap up? Uh, yes, sure. Yes. 
Um, I would like to respond to the speakers uh, who have already talked about the issue. Actually, I also vote for to build up some mechanism to um, uh, for the regular communication between the US and China about uh, um, how to address this issue. Um, yes, uh, thank okay, you. Thank you, thank you. We can write you, we can read your article later, okay? And uh, because the Dr. Her also published in English, so we can read, uh, read his, uh, her ad article later. Dr. Den, okay, one yes, second. Yes, uh, uh, the, the internet platforms uh, is for communication. And the basis of the communication is diversity. And so I hope we can, uh, we can use the uh, competition law to safeguard and promote the diversity. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Abana, please. And so I think that, uh, well, this is a non-exhaustive topic. It's at the beginning of its development, I think. And the main question is how we stay grounded when the ground itself is shaking. Uh, I'm very thankful to the panel and very insightful to all the comments and I think that we'll discover everything with the passage of time how all this problematic will evolve and, and go both uh, in European but then also in the Western Balkans which is the main the region of my main interest. Thank you. Thank you. James, last of all but not least, James please. Thank you Yik. Um, yes, to thank the Fino panel and, and the audience as well. But I would, I would say probably there needs to be a focus on the global cooperation. To deal with global platforms of the size and strength these are, we need to, to also coordinate and cooperate in order to have an equal bargaining dynamic as well. Okay, thank you all. So I think we're almost finished here. So yeah, thank you for participation. I think we are going to leave the room and uh, we will uh, have the report publish on the website, the uh, IGF website. So you are free to, free to download. And if you want to have other, any questions for the, for the speakers later, you can always contact us. So we can pass their contact to you as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone in the room and thanks for bearing with us through this hybrid session. Thank you. <laughs>